Good morning. My name is Liz, and I am the children's pastor here at Bridgewater. And it is always a gift to get to come and be in big church with you. But when I come to big church, there's a pretty good chance that I am missing a moment like what we just saw Art Linkletter experience. And that is from the 50s and 60s. But how many of you have experienced something with a small child in your life where they just say something completely off the wall? Anybody? Anybody done that? If you're a parent, there's a really good chance that you have experienced that. In my line of work, I get to encounter that often. And not that long ago when I had, it's been a little while now, but I just recently taken this role here. And on a Wednesday night, we had a group of elementary kids who were here with their parents for life groups. And I had a little more time than what I expected to have with them. And so if you're a teacher, you know you're like scrounging to like find something that will keep them occupied. And I thought I had this inspired from God idea, right? That I was going to gather them for this sweet time of connection. And so we piled on top of a shaggy, colorful rug, and I huddled them all in and said these final last words. Ask me anything that you want. (sighs) I thought it was a great idea. Turns out your children are much more inquisitive than what I expected them to be. And I wrote a list of the things that they came up with. So here we go. What is God? Who are God's parents? What was God's beginning? If everything died, would God make more humans? How were the angels made? I wonder why God made words. Um, what gender is my guardian angel? And the classic. How did God make babies? Which was immediately answered by another child who piped in with, Nah, parents make babies. At which point, I immediately jumped in with, who wants to get a drink of water at the water fountain? And off we went, and I seem to have dodged at least that bullet. Well, this morning, we're going to be addressing a few of those questions together. Um, And we're going to identify where the questions that our kids are asking, kind of where they stem from, and why they matter, not only for us as a church community and as parents and as grandparents, but for us as grown adult humans. Where do these questions come from and why do they matter? In our first half of our little mini series here, I'm gonna be covering questions through the lens of birth to 10 year olds. And this is important to us because we believe as a church that it's our privilege and our responsibility to partner with families in introducing our children to Jesus and then walking with them in discipleship. This lines up with what we see Jesus teach in the book of Matthew. We're going to be looking at chapter 18. And in this passage, Jesus has gathered with a group of his disciples. And in very true adult fashion, the disciples ask a question of Jesus. And their question is, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Will you all join me and read the response together? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Jesus' response here tells us not only that he welcomed children, that they're going to be a part of the kingdom and that they are loved by God, but also that in their humility, they are great. That's a hard adult concept to wrap our minds around. As we walk through a couple of these questions together, I want to invite you to step into it with humility, like a little child. Because I think that If we are truly willing to make ourselves humble like little children, we might discover that the questions that they're asking and the questions that we were asking as children are not actually all that different or far off from the questions that we're still asking now as adults. And the very most formative years of our lives are these zero to ten years. 
So what we want to do is kind of look at what's happening in those years that form some of our foundations and then look at some of the questions that came along with that. Before we do that, I pulled out some of my educational psychology books that have been gathering dust since my undergrad and looked at some of the statistics for what happens in a child's brain during those years. So the first one that I want to tell you about is that from birth to age one, there are over a billion neurons happening in your brain. So the neuron is the like connector, the messenger in your brain. That's more than the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, jumping around and sending messages and helping a newborn start to figure out the world. Just one year after birth, and you know this, but really think about it, just one year after being on the planet, a baby begins to walk, and they build a vocabulary. They've got 70, 80, 90 words maybe where they're learning colors already and how to identify the people that care for them and how to interact with them. As a preschooler, a three- or four-year-old, a child's brain begins to kind of remodel. It takes all of those shifting connectors and begins to build a scaffold for their future cognitive and emotional development. What that means is that as a little three- and four-year-old, the things that were happening in your brain were setting you up for the ways that you were going to learn in the future and the things that you were going to believe about yourself and about the world around you. It's a phase full of curiosity and of wonder. And as they grow into the elementary years, the wonder continues, but they begin to get a little more practical and analytical, scientific with the way that they ask questions. A really good example of kind of a mesh of those two things, the wonder and the imagination, and the practical, came out of one of our kindergarten classes just a week or two ago, and Miss Alicia, who's helping us with media today, was helping in a kindergarten room, and one of our friends asked her, hey, if you could be a superhero, and you had to have either invisibility powers or teleportation powers, which one would you have? Miss Alicia responded with, I think teleportation would be great. What would you do, Joey? And Joey, you know, then Joey says, I would choose teleportation. And she says, where would you go? I think I'd go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so imagination, fun, growing, learning all the things, and becoming more practical. He was going to take himself to get some Chick-fil-A. I think that's a great plan, Joey. As they continue to grow in those elementary years, and they have these scientific, practical, concrete things they want to figure out. That's where some of the questions that we saw on the list of things that I got from our kids come from. The where does God come from? What is this? They want some black and white answers that sometimes aren't quite as easy as all of that. In doing pastoral ministry and counseling with adults, I've often found that the issue that somebody comes in with, struggling with, may not actually be the root of the problem itself. And so by digging into what these foundations were and what some of this scaffolding is that we have, we can help to identify kind of what's going on. Some of us may have built our scaffolding on some faulty foundations when we were children. I have really good news for you. God is the layer of new foundations. So, this morning, we're going to go into this. I say we're meaning, hey guys, you're in this with me. We're going to go into this like we're little children. And that might mean that we humble ourselves and re-ask some questions that either went unanswered or that went answered but without any reference to the truth. And at the same time, we do want to add new tools to our boxes as parents and teachers and grandparents and members of a church body whose responsibility it biblically is to value and to welcome and to nurture our children in the way that Jesus did. As Pastor Tyler and I were brainstorming some of the specific questions that we might address together, I got a little bit overwhelmed with the age range that I chose because, like we just went over, the cognitive difference between a tiny baby and a 10 or 11-year-old is pretty broad. But what was interesting to me was as I thought through all the questions I've been asked or Googled things to see what other people have been asked or talked to families, it became pretty clear that the questions that kids are asking can fall under a couple of different kind of category and umbrella questions about who God is, who we are, and what God created us to do. 
So as we work through these together, that's going to be our focus, is really looking at who God is, who we are, and who he's really called us to be. These questions um, are going to set us on this path to help our kids to build a solid foundation. So it's really important that anytime we're answering these, and so that you know kind of my process in it, that before we come up with our own answers to what this looks like, that we go to the Word. So we're going to jump into our first question by also jumping in at the very beginning of the Bible. The first category that we're looking at together are questions about origin and identity. Who made God? Who made me? Where do we come from? And this is an important topic because they not only help a child understand who God is, but also what that means and who they are in light of those things. So to answer this question, we're going to first look at something that the psalmist writes in chapter 90, verse 2. And it says, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Everlasting to everlasting. God is God before time. God is God in our time. And God is God beyond our time. Genesis 1-1 makes it really clear. In the beginning, God created which means that before the beginning of us and of time as we understand it, God was already there. He's always existed. He lived outside of time and, in fact, even created the construct of time and space as we understand it. Now, this is a very abstract construct for even our most developed of adult brains to understand. So what's the bottom line that we want to take from this for our kids? The bottom line is that God is constant. No beginning, no end. When things around us are shifting and are changing, and when life on earth is so obviously finite, we can trust in a God who is bigger than all of those things. He's greater than the things he created, because he's the creator of those things, and that includes you and I. Now, if you spent time with kids, you know that even when you give an incredibly true and valid response to something, there's this phase of a kid's life where the next question is always going to be, why? And you're going to give an answer, and they're going to say why. And they're going to give an answer, and you're going to say why. And this can go on for a very long time. In this case, and with this question and explanation, one of the questions that I have found kids have with their next why is, okay, if God created everything, and if he had everything he needed, and if the world was this perfect place, why did he make us? And I think what we first want to do is look at some incorrect answers that people give for the reason that God created humans. And one of the things that I've heard out and about in my life is that God created humans because he was lonely and he needed something to be with and to love. Well, Acts 17, 24 to 25 debunks that for us, and it says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. God in the Trinity is complete regardless of any extrinsic thing, that includes humans. The truth is found, the answer to our question is found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. We are created through him and for him. We're created to bring God pleasure, and he calls his creation good. In response to questions of origin, questions of identity, we need to help our kids lay a foundation made of the truth of God's greatness, God's unchanging nature, and his constant delight in his creation, which is you and I, his children. When you're questioning your worth, you can also go to Genesis. And remember 
that the God who made you didn't make you because he needed you to fill a void. He didn't make you because he needed you to fulfill some intensely specific role here on earth. He made you because he delights in you. And he made you through him and for him in his image with all of the care and creativity of a master artist. Through him and for him. The second question and category that we're going to dig into a little bit has to do with the presence of this God with us now that he's created us. Now, I'm a 90s kid, and I was raised right here in a Midwest evangelical family. And I think when I was about eight or nine years old is when this happened, I have a vivid, vivid memory of my dad coming home from a business trip with a grocery bag wrapped up under his shoulder, and inside was a VHS. Kids, that's a, you know, like a videotape, you know? You put it in, VHS tape, um, with some strange-looking vegetables on the front of it. The very first episode of VeggieTales that had ever been recorded came home with my dad from that trip. And in this first video, they address the issue of, where is God when I'm scared? And in it, we find Junior Asparagus, the guy in the little yellow hat, having watched a movie he was told not to. And in the movie, there's a stalk of celery who is playing the part of Frankenstein. And Junior finds himself very afraid when he lays down to go to sleep that night. And as he's shaking in his bed, hearing things under his bed, little monsters in his pajamas, he is visited by Bob the tomato and Larry the cucumber, who teach him a song to help him remember God's presence when he's scared. And this song for me, how many of you have one of those songs that anytime things get like quiet or awkward, you start like humming it? Like it's the go-to? That could just be a me thing, I don't really know. But for me, that song is the song I'm about to tell you about. The song is called God is Bigger Than the, anybody know? Boogeyman. Than the Boogeyman. God is Bigger Than the Boogeyman. And at the end of this song, Junior Asparagus says this in the bridge, and I'm going to read it to you. So when I'm lying in my bed and the furniture starts creeping, I'll just laugh and say, hey, cut that out and get back to my sleeping. Because I know that God's the biggest, and he's watching all the while. And when I get scared, I'll think of him and close my eyes and smile. He sings it just like that. Just like it. And Junior walks away from this song and this experience, understanding better that God is with him, even in his scariest of moments. And he closes his eyes, and he thinks about that, and he's able to fall asleep. Now, this video seemed fairly, like, practical in my simple nine-year-old concrete mind. God did feel really big, and I had no doubt that he could take down Godzilla. However, I never really faced any Godzillas in my life. And it turns out that there are much scarier things in the world. So now that I know what those realities are, is God still bigger than the boogeymen that are in my life? Is God bigger than financial struggle? Is God bigger than broken relationships? Is God bigger than disease? Is God bigger than depression? Is God bigger than unmet expectations? I think that if we can instill a foundation for our children that says that, yes, God is bigger than these things, and that, yes, God is present with his children, then when they're scared, whether it's when they're five and afraid of monsters, or if it's when they're 31 and it's afraid of what the next big season of life will look like, they're going to know where to place their focus. God is present and active with his creation. One of my favorite Bible stories is when Peter gets out of the boat and walks in the water with Jesus. Many of you have probably heard it, but we'll talk about it a little bit. The disciples are out on this boat. Jesus has sent them to wait for him while he goes alone to pray. And the waves are rocking, and it's a bit stormy. And Jesus, it's time for him to go back and meet with them. And this is not in the Bible. This is how I imagine it happening. I picture Jesus, like, standing on the shore thinking about how he's going to do this and being like, Ugh, they're going to think this is really cool. Watch this. And so he steps out on the water, and he's walking towards them. And in their humanness, the disciples, who are closer to Jesus than anyone on the earth, see him coming, 
And instead of being like, that's so cool, go, <gasps> it's a ghost. So the disciples are flipping out on their boat, and Jesus is coming towards them. And instead of letting them sit in their fear, he calls out and he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And not only that, but a little bit later in the story, he invites Peter to come out onto the water with him. I think that he does that for us, too. In the moments when things are weird around us and we can't quite figure out where he is and we don't exactly know what he looks like, he calls out and he says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And then he invites us to step out of the boat. And when we read about Peter stepping out of the boat, we learn a little bit more about what it looks like to be bold and have courage in Jesus. At first, Peter focuses his gaze on who Jesus is. He steps out onto the waves, and he walks boldly. But when he feels the wind, and when he sees the waves, the gaze breaks, and he immediately begins to sink. If I'm being honest with you, I think there's a lot of moments in my life that as soon as those feelings start to shift, my gaze begins to change. How often do we let what we feel take our gaze off of the Prince of Peace when all we really want is peace and look onto the chaos? When was the last time that you saw something that seemed bigger than God, who invited you to step out of the boat in the first place and think that it's too big for him to handle? We can live lives, and we can help our kids to live lives, of freedom in the midst of the scariest of circumstances. To answer the question of where God is when I'm scared, what we need to know and say and claim is that he is near. God is near. And he invites you to lock eyes with him no matter what is happening around you. Over the past several years, I've had some really cool moments and interesting opportunities to do ministry with people in some more one-on-one -on -one pastoral settings. And one of my favorite God stories came out of a ministry session like this where a woman had come in to meet with some pastors at the church that I was at um, who had just been struggling with this intense fear and anxiety. And she had been to some counselors and some therapists, and there were really healthy things happening there, but something wasn't right. And she couldn't quite figure out, like, where is this fear coming from? It was hard to identify the situations where it was most prominent. She just wasn't sure what was going on. And so she came in, and we were planning on spending some time just talking with her and praying over her, asking God for peace and healing in that situation. And while we were doing that, one of the other pastors who was with me looked at her and asked her if she would feel safe just sharing some things about her childhood. And so as she started to talk about that, she, her emotions kind of shifted, and she bravely told us about how her parents had had a lot of struggles when she was growing up. And when she was about five or six, there was one night when her dad had come home very angry and very intoxicated. And in that moment of sharing with us, it was very clear to her that that was the first time in her life that she'd ever felt the same kind of anxiety and fear as what she'd been experiencing in her current context. And so as pastors, we gathered around her, and we just asked the Lord to come and bring peace and to heal any kind of trauma that had happened in those moments that laid a foundation that told her that something about God was not true to who he actually is. And as we prayed over her, there just was this peace in the room. And afterwards, she just had her eyes closed, and you could tell that she was crying. And I said to her, what, what, are, what are you thinking about? What do you see? And very softly, she said, he's there. And I was like, I have no idea what this woman is talking about. He's like, he's there, he's there. It's like, who, who's there? What do you see? And she was like, he's there. Jesus was there in that room with me. I see him. He was there the whole time. I just couldn't open my eyes. Isn't it amazing that we serve a God who is so active and who answers our questions and our fears with love and grace and reminders of his presence in incredible ways. The next time that you feel fear or anxiety trying to wiggle its way into your mind or your heart, open your eyes. Look for Jesus and lock eyes with him. 
his gaze is always on you. If you're a parent of a child who is struggling with fear or with anxiety, one practice that I really love is inviting your child to imagine Jesus in the room with them. Imagination is from God. And I truly believe that at those childhood years, when they're using their imagination, they're in tune with Holy Spirit in a lot of ways. And so by inviting them to picture Jesus and to think about where he literally could be in the situation, you're giving them a chance to kind of play that out and to learn that for themselves. Help them find words to pray and to ask Jesus for comfort. Remind them that God is, in fact, much bigger than the boogeyman. And then claim it over yourself, too. The third and final question category that we're going to answer together is one that the entire world around us is struggling to answer. We're going to put a picture up on the screen. And, I mean, I just feel like there's got to be something to the celebrity status of a dinosaur that looks that creepy. Like, I don't know why we loved it so much when we were little, but I think part of it had to do with the theme song. So, the Barney theme song, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. It's all about love. There's a reason that stories of love and happy endings have entire theme parks built around them. There's a reason that watching the little heart like symbol add up on my Instagram is so addicting. There's a reason that your kindergartner is looking for attention. There's a reason why in just my downloaded Spotify library, there are over 70 plus songs with the word love in the title alone. We want an answer to the question, am I loved? And if we aren't helping our kids to answer this question with truth, they will find answers in the things that the world is marketing to them. They'll look for the answer in achievements or in striving. They'll look for the answers in the ways that others react to them and give them attention in unhealthy ways. They'll look for answers in shallow pools that cannot even begin to approach or scratch the depth of the unconditional love and hope that we know in Jesus. Um, we have a picture of my family from when I was really little. And look at them. My parents were just a 90s dream up there. And although they are the first ones to admit that they were not perfect parents, in fact, my mom once got a phone call from my first and second grade teacher. And the teacher called and said that they needed to have a parent-teacher conference. And my mom was like, what'd you do? And I was like, I don't know. So she goes into the conference, and it turns out the conference was for her. <laughs> yeah, we still talk about it. And the reason that they'd call my mom in was because she so badly wanted me to know how deeply loved and cared for I was that sometimes I didn't get to learn how to do things by myself. And so the conference was to help my mom kind of understand what a helicopter parent term meant and work on that a little bit. She, she knows I'm telling this story. It's cool. And she made some really solid adjustments. One thing that my parents really did very well was instilling in each of us who exactly we were loved by. Every night before bed, whichever one was tucking us in at night after we were tucked in and the lights were off, would stand in the doorway and say, Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. Jesus loves you most. Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. Jesus loves you most. And that lasted well into my teen years, publicly at times, when I was getting into the car. They'd be like, Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. Jesus loves you most. And I'm like, oh, stop. But I never questioned who loved me the most. It followed me into college through emails. It followed me when I was traveling abroad on FaceTime calls. Very rarely would it end without a mommy loves you, daddy loves you, Jesus loves you most. This isn't to say that my brothers and I are immune to feelings of inadequacy or that I always look for love in the right places instead of the wrong ones. But even in those moments when I don't feel the truth of it at a foundational level, I know that there is a love that is unconditional, even more unconditional than my parents. The truth is that no matter how much we want to be able to provide everything that our children need, no matter how validating we are of their feelings, no matter how proud we are of their accomplishments, 
or how patient we are with their outbursts. We cannot love them as much as their Father in heaven does. We can model it, and we can live it out in our actions and in our words and in our relationships, but ultimately the love that we show to others should point directly back to the source of all love, to Jesus. We find the answer to the question, am I loved, in the sacrifice of a Savior. John 3.16 is the first verse that I ever learned as a child, and it's one of the first ones that we teach to our kids here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The answer is yes. You are loved by a God who is the beginning and who is the end, who is constant, who is present with you. You are loved by a God who requires nothing of you. No striving, no accomplishments, no title. Simply belief in him. At the risk of sounding like the world, because they've tried to twist this, love truly is the answer. But love is the answer as given freely by God in Christ. And you and I have the power and the responsibility to share this hope with future generations. Our response to a love like this is found later in the book of Matthew, and we're going to look at it together in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40. Once again, we encounter the disciples asking adult questions about greatest things. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love is the answer to the darndest of our questions. Say it, live it, teach it. If there are children in your life, help them to grasp the reality of the goodness of God by reminding them regularly and consistently of who and whose they are by living boldly in obedience and freedom, and by showing and receiving the love of Christ in your own life. Maybe this morning you're really at a point where you're just starting to get to know the story of Jesus, or maybe you've noticed some weak spots in the foundations that were laid in your own childhood. God's desire for each of us is healing and is wholeness. And in our relationship with him and our relationships with ourselves, which, let's be real, can sometimes be the hardest one. God wants to fill in those cracks that have sometimes formed in our foundations. Because if our foundations have cracks, the rest of the structures that we build on top of them, even when they're full of really good things, can fall more easily. As I was praying into what this morning would look like and just asking God to reveal himself in unique ways. I happened to have a little mini road trip in the midst of that where I had some quiet time. And so the first part of the trip, I was praying into it and listening to some worship music. And I finished my time doing that and decided it was time to listen to a podcast. There's a lot of great podcasts. I couldn't decide which one I wanted. And so I kind of roulette style flipped through the top podcast list on Apple, whatever. And I landed on one called The Big One. And the big one is this 10-episode podcast about the San Andreas Fault in California and the inevitability of this massive earthquake. And so basically it's a survivalist podcast, and at the end of it they're giving you all of these tips on how to survive if an earthquake happens. I listened to all 10 episodes. I know. So the good news is I'm very prepared for an earthquake. We're set. Um, But... All of that to say, one of the most interesting things that happened as I was listening to it was that so much of what they were talking about was how 50, 60 years ago, when this earthquake, there were earthquakes in California, the buildings were not prepared. And so it wasn't a major earthquake, and things were really bad because the foundations of the buildings were not stable enough to withstand the moving of the earth. And so now, one of the steps that they're taking is to go in and reinforce these foundations. And it's doable, which is really cool, that they can go and start taking steps towards something that looks like it may happen someday in the future and make it safer for the people who are living in these buildings. 
God can restore our foundations. The earthquakes that have happened before in our lives cause cracks. The things that we were taught that are not true, the lies that we believe about who we are, about who God is, those things are real, and there's no guilt and shame in that. That's what life looks like. But we believe in a God who can come in and do the research. He doesn't have to research. He's God. But knows exactly what it all looks like and knows what's coming and when it's coming. He's not going to be surprised by the big one, right? And so when we look at these questions and when we look at the answers to them and lean on the truth of who God is, he restores that foundation and allows us to walk in a freedom and in a wholeness and in a love that he created through and for him for us. It's pretty incredible.